Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Thomas Sir. I'm the CEO of Kinexum. Today's public webcast by Kinexum features Dr. Ralph DeFranzo on prevention in type 2 diabetes, a rational approach based on its pathophysiology. A couple housekeeping points first. Dr. DeFranzo will be sharing slides as he talks, so if there are folks who are only calling in, it would be best if you could log in over the internet. For best sound quality of, for everyone on the call, please keep your microphone on mute until the discussion section. And this is particularly true if you're listening on computer speakers, which can cause feedback. Second, in order to access the presentation slide deck, you'll need to accept offers that uh, show up on your screen that have popped up uh, from uh, Dr. DeFranzo or from our Connection associate, Jennifer Zhao. So please accept them, and then you'll be able to share, you'll be able to see the slides. Third, if you have any questions along the way or at the conclusion of Dr. DeFranzo's presentation, please enter it in the chat column on the right of your screen. If you look to the right of your screen, you can see a, an icon that shows a speech bubble, sort of like in a comic strip. Uh, we'll raise your questions in the order received, and Dr. DeFranzo will try to answer as many of those as we, as we can during the session. Fourth. A YouTube video of this slide presentation and accompanying the audio will be posted on our website at www.kinexum.com within the next several business days. And finally, I want to sneak in plugs for a couple of future events uh, of ours. The first is our next public uh, webcast on April 12th when Jeff Bachman, head of oncology at Cello Health Bioconsulting, previously defined health, will conduct a fireside chat with Dr. Brian Leyland Jones of Avera Cancer Institute, previously affiliated with Stanford, Cornell, McGill, Emory, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and NCI, on some astounding recent successes in cancer treatment, as well as some complex challenges. And the second event is our Metabesity Conference, October 15 to 16, at the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, DC. You can check out our stellar growing speaker roster, which includes Victor Zhao, President of the National Institute of Medicine, Richard Hodes, Director of the National Institute on Aging, Janet Woodcock, Director of CEDAR at FDA. For this uh, audience, uh, folks like Philip Holm of uh, Newcastle, Will Cephalou of ADA, John Booth of UNC, and others. And information on both events can be found on our website, connectsum.com. So at this point, I'd now like to introduce the, uh, uh, or throw, throw it over to the founder and executive chairman of Connectsum. G. Alexander, known as Zan Fleming, to introduce today's speaker. Well, thanks, Thomas. And wow, what a great pleasure and honor to have my friend and esteemed colleague, Ralph DeFranzo, better known to some of his friends as the Fonz. Uh, <laughs> and for, for you in the metabolic world, Ralph truly needs no introduction. But for those from other fields who have joined us, and I'm glad to see that we have a wide variety of people who are interested in this topic, let me just say that from his early days at Yale and Harvard to decades at his major research center that he built down in San Antonio, Ralph has been involved, not just involved, but he's instigated or been a central figure in every major therapeutic class development starting with metformin, insulin analogs, incretins, and most recently, and probably most important, the SGLT2 inhibitors, which for the first time in the history of diabetic therapeutics have shown benefits beyond just providing control of glycemia. Ralph essentially invented that field, and let me show you how. Uh, when I was at FDA uh, relatively early on in my career there. Uh, Ralph came to me with a request for an IND for a natural substance, substance called fluorazin. And it seemed like a no-brainer, but I had a very difficult medical reviewer that gave Ralph hell. <laughs> and uh, we won't go into all the details, but fortunately, I was able to control the medical reviewer uh, to, <laughs> to uh, deal with some challenges that allowed Ralph to proceed. The point here is that this early effort back in the 90s with Florizin 
led to the field of SGLT2 inhibitors. So that's just one example of how Ralph has been a major contributor, not just to the science, but to the therapeutic development of products for people with diabetes. So Ralph, without further ado, we are just so glad to have you and we look forward to what you have to say. Well, that was a very kind uh, introduction and I really appreciate it. And Zan and I do go back uh, a long way and we did lots of exciting things uh, uh, together. Uh, so today, what I'm going to do is <clears throat> I'm going to start in a sort of pre-diabetic uh, stage and review uh, with you what we've learned about what leads up to diabetes. And then I'll take us into the diabetes stage and review what are the drugs that are uh, available. And for me, this is a very exciting time in diabetes uh, because of all the cardiovascular outcome trials that have recently come out showing that uh, a lot of the newer drugs actually reduce cardiovascular events. And this has led to a major change in the ADA approach to uh, treatment of type 2 diabetes, uh, which, of course, is going to be a major benefit to our patients. So we're going we're gonna to start with, quote, the pre-diabetic state. It's a term that I, I personally don't like. Uh, so this is like the young lady who goes to see the OBGYN doctor uh, at three months, and the OBGYN doctor tells her she's pregnant, uh, and you know what's going to happen at nine months. She's going to deliver a baby. She doesn't have pre, uh, uh, you know, just pre-pregnancy. She is pregnant. <laughs> and I would say the same sort of approach applies uh, to, quote, pre-diabetes. Uh, so if we, we look, and these are the most recent data uh, in, in the U.S., we have about 30 million uh, people with type 2 diabetes, and unfortunately, uh, about one out of every three of these people is untreated. And of course, the longer you're untreated, the higher your A1C is, meaning the worse the glycemic control, the more likely you are to develop the microvascular, eye, kidney, and nerve complications of the disease. And then we have a very large number of people for every one person who has diabetes, we have two to three people who have, uh, quote, prediabetes. And we'll talk a little bit more about what prediabetes uh, means. And it's been estimated by the CDC, and these data are from the CDC, uh, that we uh, are going to continue to see this epidemic uh, of uh, diabetes. Uh, and uh, throughout the world, uh, this is an epidemic that is uh, associated with I increase in uh, wealth uh, as society advances. Uh, unfortunately, our, uh, our exercise patterns uh, tend to deteriorate. We tend to eat more, uh, and uh, weight gain is the major driving cause uh, of this diabetes uh, epidemic. So this is an analysis that was uh, done by the American Diabetes Association of the cost of treating uh, diabetes. And I'm going to make a very important point uh, on this. About one-third of the costs are from cardiovascular disease, uh, peripheral vascular disease. And we know now that uh, cardiovascular disease is really in a very, very small way related to hyperglycemia. One-third of the costs are related to the microvascular complications. All of these complications, as I said, are directly related to two factors. How high is your A1C and how long your A1C has been elevated? And then there are uh, about one third of the costs that are associated with other things, office visits, uh, uh, et cetera. But if we can control the A1C and we don't let the A1C go up, we should be able to completely prevent eye, kidney, and nerve complications. So if we truly can prevent prediabetes from going to diabetes, this should decrease the microvascular complications and be cost uh, uh, efficient. So. There are two ways, well, actually three ways, I'll come back to the third way in a second, in which we can make the diagnosis of diabetes. One is to measure the fasting glucose, and if the fasting glucose is between 100 and 25, we say you have impaired fasting glucose, a prediabetic state. The other way is to give individuals an oral glucose tolerance test, and then we can measure the two-hour glucose, and if the two-hour glucose is between 140 and 199, we say you have impaired glucose tolerance, another prediabetic state. Uh, and uh, if we measure the A1C, 
The A1C, if it's between 5.7 and 6.4, also makes the diagnosis of prediabetes. The problem is the A1C doesn't tell us about whether you have IFG or IGT, and as you're going to see in a moment, IFG and IGT are two very different uh, clinical entities with very different prevalences and very low overlap, and because they have different pathophysiologic uh, 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 underpinnings, it's very likely that the treatment uh, to prevent prediabetes from going to diabetes in these two groups uh, is going to be different. So to make uh, this point pretty clear, uh, what I'm going to show you is the shape of the OGDT in people with IGT and in people with IFG. So let's first start with the people with impaired fasting glucose. And this is sort of a representative uh, schematic uh, curve in which on the x-axis I've plotted time and then on the y-axis the plasma glucose. So people, as we showed many, many years ago, and this has been now reproduced by over 20 studies, uh, in, in people with impaired fasting glucose start with an elevated fasting glucose. So I've shown it here represented by 110. And then you give them a, a glucose uh, challenge, and what you see, the glucose rises. It actually rises into, quote, the diabetic range, 210 here. But then at, at two hours later, it's back to where you started, okay? If we look at people who have impaired glucose tolerance, you can see this curve is very, very different. So people with IGT start with a normal fasting glucose, but when then you give them the glucose low, you can see that the glucose uh, level rises progressively. And at two hours, it's now in that, quote, uh, abnormal range. So if you just simply look at the shape of these curves, you can see that there must be a very different pathophysiologic pinning uh, to these two disorders. And without going into the, the pathophysiology in great detail, we know that people with impaired fasting glucose have insulin resistance in the liver and impaired first phase insulin secretion. People with impaired glucose tolerance have insulin resistance in the muscle and impaired second phase insulin secretion. So the pathophysiology is very different and therefore it is very likely that they would respond differently uh, to uh, different uh, medications. But both of these disorders, IFG and IGT, have a similar high risk of progression to diabetes. So this is an analysis that Dr. Abdulghani and I carried out on the Botnia study, which was carried out by Dr. Leif Group, and it looks at the seven to eight year incidence rate of conversion of IFG to, or IGT uh, to uh, diabetes. Uh, and then uh, you can see that the conversion rates, the two middle bars, are very similar. And about 20% of these people over seven years are going to convert to diabetes. And if you have combined IFG and IGT, you see the conversion rate jumps up uh, to 50%. Uh, so this is a uh, this pre-diabetic state is a high risk state for future development of diabetes. And as I'm going to show you as we go through this, the pathophysiology of IGT and IFG is the same pathophysiology that's present in people with type 2 diabetes. It's just not quite as severe. So if you have a person who has, say, a hemoglobin A1C of 6.3, what is really the difference between that person who, quote, has prediabetes and the person who has an A1C of 6.5, who has diabetes? Simply, it's a difference in the severity of the underlying uh, disorders. Now, the other important message is that IGT, impaired glucose tolerance, is associated with an increased cardiovascular risk. These people have the metabolic syndrome. If you have pure IFG, this is not associated with the metabolic syndrome. So if you make the diagnosis of IGT, these people really have the insulin resistance or the metabolic syndrome. They very commonly uh, have central obesity, they have uh, diabetic dyslipidemia, they have endothelial dysfunction, and we need to start paying more attention to the cardiovascular risk factors in these people with IGT, because what really kills our diabetic patients are the car cardiovascular complications. What causes the suffering are the microvascular complications, eye, kidney, and nerve damage. So. I raised the question is why should we use pharmacologic therapy 
to prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes in these high-risk individuals. And as you can see here, the answer is pretty simple, that non-pharmacologic therapy, diet and exercise, I'm going to review with you with this, does not work on a long-term uh, basis in the real world. Now, having said that, if you ask me if I could develop one drug to prevent diabetes or to treat diabetes, it would be a drug that was very inexpensive and got people to lose weight and got them back down to ideal body weight. Because if I could achieve that, I would probably get rid of 80% of the drugs that I use to treat people with type 2 diabetes. So the issue is not whether diet and exercise and weight loss work. For sure they work. The problem is, can we maintain the weight loss on a long period of time? And that really has been a big problem. So there are two review articles I've given you the references down here, uh, which have looked at randomized controlled trials that have gone on for at least six weeks, 16 weeks uh, duration, in which uh, intensive lifestyle has been uh, instituted. And the uh, maximum decrease in BMI is about 1.9 if you put uh, all of these trials together. Uh, but the weight regain in terms of BMI is 0.36 kilograms per meter squared. What that means in five years, you've regained all of the weight that you lost. So on a long-term basis, it's difficult uh, to maintain uh, the weight loss. Now, this is uh, uh, shown pretty graphically in the look-ahead study. And different people have different interpretations of what did the, the effect of lifestyle intervention uh, do uh, in terms of remission of diabetes and cardiovascular disease. As you probably know, this study was designed to look at lifestyle intervention and protection or prevention of cardiovascular disease, and it was stopped because uh, it really didn't show any benefit. So in year one, with this very intensive uh, uh, lifestyle intervention, uh, people lost 8.6% of their body weight, which is, of course, fantastic. But look at year four. Now, these are diabetic patients. Half the weight is regained. If we look at any remission, meaning a drop in the A1C or decrease in medications, at year one, I would say this is not very impressive, about 12%. to 12%. Uh, And at year four, even less, only 7.3% of the people. Uh, and if we look at complete remission, meaning the A1C is in the normal range and people are off medications, at whether you look at year one or year four, uh, the data really are not very impressive. Now, by no means am I saying that we should not try uh, as best we can to get people to lose weight. Of course, this has got to be the cornerstone of our management. But we also have to be realistic and understand that weight loss in the pre-diabetic state or here in the diabetic state is not really going to get the level of A1C uh, to a point where it's going to prevent the microvascular complications. So uh, <clears throat> what do we need to, what criteria do we need to satisfy that say that screening for a disease is appropriate? Well, a number of organizations have looked at this, and actually there's been a U.S. task force to come up with these criteria that I'm going to share with you. So first, the disease must be serious. Diabetes, I, I would say, is a serious disease, and if we can pick it up in the pre-diabetic state and treat it and prevent you from getting an A1C that's in the range that causes microvascular complications, that would be good. We should know the natural history of the disease, and we know very well the natural history as we go from normal glucose tolerance to pre-diabetic state to diabetes. It should be detectable at a preclinical state, and we can do that by the fasting glucose. We can do it with the A1C, or we can give a glucose tolerance test. The screening test should be quick, inexpensive, and valid. The A1C and the fasting glucose are. We should have effective therapies, uh, and I'm going to show you we have them. In addition to diet intervention, uh, we have a number of pharmacologic therapies that uh, work. The early, uh, it sh we should be able to show that early treatment is more effective than late treatment. And I will show you, in fact, that that is the case. The longer you wait to treat people with diabetes, the more beta cells you lose. If that happens, then eventually these people are going to go on to insulin therapy. And you can look at any studies you want. Insulin therapy is very difficult for people with type 2 diabetes. And glycemic control and people on insulin therapy we're not talking about type 1, we're talking about type 2, is worse than people who are controlled on oral agents. Screening improves outcomes. This 
it might be argued that we don't have data to support this, uh, but in my opinion, type 2 diabetes meets all of these criteria. And in 2014, uh, there was a task force uh, that, in fact, was put together, the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, that came to the conclusion that, in fact, that type 2 diabetes uh, met all of these criteria, and they recommended screenings for abnormal blood glucose, pre-diabetic people or high-risk people. And who were the people that they recommended? Adults over the age of 45 who were either overweight or obese and had first-degree relatives with type 2 diabetes. I would add to this list people who have gestational a history of gestational diabetes or people with the metabolic uh, syndrome. And then they also emphasized that uh, certain minority groups, blacks, Latinos, Hispanics, were at increased risk for type 2 diabetes. So here in San Antonio, we have a very large Hispanic uh, population. I see a patient who's overweight uh, and uh, their mom has type 2 diabetes. I measure the A1C at 6.2 or 6.3. I can assure you virtually all of these people are going to, over the next 5 to 10 years, develop diabetes. We have lots of families where both mom and dad uh, in the Hispanic community have type 2 diabetes. I don't need to wait, in my opinion, uh, to their A1C gets into the overtly diabetic range. Uh, these people are going to develop diabetes, and we would argue that treatment should be started uh, at the time we see that the A1C is in the sixth range. Now, what is the evidence that we can prevent diabetes if we pick up these people with prediabetes? So this is the diabetes prevention uh, program. Uh, it's a, a, a quite... I think, uh, important and, well, rec uh, I think, uh, publicized study. So these are people with prediabetes, IGT. Uh, you, and not surprisingly, uh, most of these people are overweight. And then they would, for purpose of now, come back and tell you there is a fourth group. There were three groups, intensive lifestyle change. I'll show you what that means in a second. Metformin, standard lifestyle. And then the people were followed up for three years. So what happened? So uh, with uh, metformin, there was a 31% decrease in the conversion rate of IGT to type 2 uh, diabetes, and there's been a recent uh, publication that has just appeared that over 15 years, metformin uh, actually, from the cost standpoint, was at least neutral. Diet and exercise decreased the conversion rate of IGT to, to diabetes by 58%. So no, no doubt in diet and exercise lifestyle is the most effective uh, intervention we have. But can we maintain this on a long-term basis? I'll come back to that in a second. So there was a, a, another group, a fourth group in the DBP, who got treated with a thiazolidinedione, troglitazone. But uh, this drug had a, a, a specific side effect that led to its discontinuation. So uh, people did not go for the entire three years on troglitazone. So what the investigators did, because the drug was discontinued as the study was going on, they looked at the number of cases per 100 patient treatment years uh, who developed uh, diabetes. So you can see to the left in yellow, lifestyle light was the least effective. Metformin was effective, more effective lifestyle light, but not as effective as heavy, uh, heavy lifestyle intervention. And the most effective therapy was troglitazone. And I'm going to show you that over the years, there have been many studies done with the TZDs. And this class, in my opinion, is the most effective uh, group, uh, although we have other pharmacologic interventions which have also been effective. So let's take a look at what happened in terms of the change in body weight. You can see that the investigators did a phenomenal job in the first year. Uh, these people lost 7 kilograms of body weight uh, with the lifestyle intervention. Metformin lost about 2.5 to 3 kilos. But look what happened with time. Over three years, that about half of the weight was regained. And then after three years, uh, there was a reinstitution of the program, uh, the lifestyle program. But nonetheless, you can see they continued to regain uh, weight. Uh, what's interesting is the metformin people actually maintained the weight loss. And then when we're out to six to eight years, there's really no difference in the weight loss between the metformin and the lifestyle uh, group. So let's take a look at what was the lifestyle intervention. 
16 sessions, this was the core curriculum, taught by a case manager on a one-to-one -one basis during the first 24 weeks. This is incredibly expensive and impractical. But remember, the, the purpose of this study was to show that if you could get people to lose weight, it would work, okay? After, the, uh, after these 16 core sessions, there were monthly one-on-one -on -one sessions as well as group sessions to reinforce the behavioral change. And there was an exercise program that was put into place where the people had to exercise for 150 minutes per week under supervision. But most of us are not able to, to do that. And then, as I said, after three years, the diabetes prevention program was uh, 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 stopped. And then there was a reinstitution it's called the DPP outcome study. And I showed you that despite reinstitution with another 16 core sessions, you saw that the people continued to lose, uh, to gain weight. So, as I said, weight loss is incredibly effective uh, uh, in preventing prediabetes from going to diabetes. But maintaining the weight loss is a big problem, okay? Now, the other thing which people don't like to talk about from the diabetes prevention uh, program and the references here, if you want to look it up, Despite the fact that people lost weight and successfully lost it, still 40 to 50 percent of the people with IGT progressed to type 2 diabetes. So even if you lose weight, although on mean we decrease the uh, uh, progression rate, there's still half of the people progress to avert diabetes. So what about pharmacologic therapy? Well, it does work, and we really have lots of uh, uh, data to support this. So there are three big studies with uh, metformin, and uh, one is the study done in China, and uh, I think the diabetes in China is a little bit different, and you can see that uh, in uh, China, the incidence of diabetes in the group getting placebo was 11.6, about 12% per year, very high, and, and there was a quite dramatic reduction. Uh, this is sort of the aberrant uh, of the studies that we're going to look at, 77% decrease. So we have the Indian Diabetes Prevention Program and then the U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program, and uh, you can see here the percent conversion per year is between 11 and 18%, and there's about a 30% reduction in the conversion rate of IGT or prediabetes to diabetes. <clears throat> Very impressive data with uh, the TCDs. So the DPP, uh, the Tripod, Dream Study, PiPod Study, the ACNOW Study that we carried out with uh, pioglitazone, but you can see that all three of the TZDs, pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, troglitazone, uh, markedly decreased between 60 to 75 percent the conversion rate of IGT to type 2 diabetes. And if you look at the uh, conversion rate in the controls, in these very diverse populations, it's really not all that uh, dissimilar. Uh, it, it, you can see here it's going from 6.5% up to 18% with a mean of about 10% per year, which means that after five years on mean, about half of the people with prediabetes will have converted to diabetes. And then we have both the stop NIDM study with Arcabos and a Japanese study with Vogvibos, all showing a, a effective reduction uh, in the conversion rate of IGT to diabetes. And more recently, uh, we have now data from the SCALE study uh, with GLP-1 receptor agonist that there's about a 70 to 75% reduction in the conversion rate of, quote, prediabetes IGT to diabetes. So we have a number of pharmacologic interventions which have been shown to reduce the conversion rate of prediabetes to diabetes. So let's take a look at the TZDs. Now, uh, in the tripod study, this is Dr. Buchanan's study in the, tri in the PIPOD. This is troglitazone and pioglitazone, reduction of 50 to 60 percent. The DREAM study, Dr. Stephen Kahn, a reduction of about 60 percent. In our study, uh, the DREAM study is with rosiglitazone. Ours is with pioglitazone, a reduction of 72 percent. All really, I would say, very impressive in terms of reducing the conversion rate of IGT to diabetes. So let me just show you the ACNOW study. This was the lead article in the New England Journal of Medicine some uh, eight years or so ago. We screened 1,850 people, came up with 602 people with IGT. Half went to placebo, half went to pioglitazone. 
uh, and then they were followed up for three years. So in yellow, you can see the conversion rate in the placebo group. In orange, the conversion rate in the pioglitazone group, and we decreased the conversion rate from 7.6% to 2.1% per year, has a ratio of 0.28. This is, in my opinion, very impressive, and it's very similar to the other studies with the TZDs. And now that uh, pioglitazone is generic, in the state of Texas, pioglitazone costs about 5 to $10 per month. So it really is a quite affordable uh, uh, medication. Now, the number needed to treat. We need to treat 18 subjects with IgT for one year to prevent one case of type 2 diabetes. To put this into perspective, if you have hypercholesterolemia and I put you on a statin, I need to treat about 40 to 45 cases per year to prevent one myocardial infarction. Well, I don't want my patients having a myocardial infarction, so obviously uh, I am uh, going to have all of my diabetic people on a statin. I also don't want them developing diabetes. And prevention of diabetes with pioglitazone uh, was more effective than prevention of a myocardial infarction with statin. So uh, in summary, we actually have a, a number of very positive interventions. Diet and exercise. And quite frankly, uh, if I could get all of my patients to lose weight and get down to ideal body weight, uh, I would be the happiest guy in the world, and that would be the best treatment that I could give my patients, but it doesn't work on a long-term basis. We have many three big positive studies with metformin. We have now seven studies with TZDs, uh, the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, I showed you two of them, and then more recently the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So there are a number of uh, uh, studies that show that we can effectively prevent uh, prediabetes uh, from going on to diabetes, but there are no drugs I want to emphasize that are approved by the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of uh, prediabetes. Uh, uh, this would require a very long-term study uh, in a large number of people to show that we decrease either micro or macrovascular complications. And it's very unlikely that such a study is going to be done unless it's carried out by the NIH uh, because pharmaceutical companies are not going to carry out these kind of long-term studies, okay? So one argument comes up, why don't we just wait until we make the diagnosis of diabetes to start metformin therapy, or even better, to start an agent that preserves beta cell function, which is the major reason why prediabetes progresses to diabetes and why the A1C rises progressively in diabetic patients. So this is a, a, a study that I've uh, uh, taken uh, from Kaiser Permanente, uh, where they have very good meticulous uh, records. So every time the person gets a lab test, the A1C done, it's uh, recorded. And we also know exactly from the pharmaceutical uh, record when medications are starting. So if we look at people uh, as we go from left to right, people are being treated with diet and exercise. How long does it take the physician to make some change, add a medication, uh, when the A1C comes back greater than 8? Not greater than 7, not greater than 6.5, but greater than 8. And quite frankly, I don't think any diabetic should be walking around with an A1C that's greater than 7, okay? Minimum recommendation by the ADA, and I favor 6.5. But anyway, in this study, they say greater than 8. It took almost nine months. If the person was on metformin, the A1C comes back greater than 8. Uh, it took almost 15 months for the physician to do something, either increase the dose of metformin at a new drug. If they're on a cell phone urea alone, 20 months. And if they're on metformin and cell phone urea, and the A1C comes back greater than 8, 26 months. It's called physician inertia. And this is not just unique to Kaiser Permanente. So these are two very large uh, uh, medical records from insurance companies uh, uh, where uh, people look at the t time uh, when, uh, how long did it take to intensify uh, the medical uh, treatment. So in the Kunti study and the Nickel study, it basically took three years and the mean A1C at the time of intensification was 8.7. So the simple fact is that physicians, even when they make the diagnosis of diabetes, don't change the treatment. Uh, if we have people with prediabetes, these people are simply not followed up. 
and instituting any therapy in those people, and unless we really now start to focus on this, is going to take even longer. Now, the biggest concern is that the longer you wait to intervene, the more beta cells that you are going to lose. So this is a study uh, published by Dr. Peter Butler. And so Dr. Butler, he, he, he has a strange vocation in life. He collects dead bodies. Uh, and, of course, this is all done with uh, IRB uh, uh, approval. And he extracts the, the pancreas, and he's going to measure the beta cell volume using actually very sophisticated techniques. Now, obviously, he can't wake the person up and do an OGDT, but he, can he, he has a measure of the fasting glucose. So he's now going to look at people with impaired fasting glucose compared to people with normal glucose tolerance. So the glucose is in the top, but what I want you to focus on is the bottom. These people have lost about 50% of their beta cell volume, uh, which is uh, a surrogate measure of beta cell mass, and there's further loss uh, in the people with type 2 diabetes. Now, personally, I think that in the pre-diabetic state here, IFG, this is a great overestimate of the loss of beta cell mass. I think it's more in the order of 10 to 20%, but the point is, even in the pre-diabetic state, you're losing beta cells. And as the disease progresses into the diabetic state, you're losing more beta cells. And the longer you wait, the more likely it's going to be that when we intervene with oral or injectables such as GLP-1, uh, you're not going to get uh, the kind of response that's going to get the A1C less than 7, the ADA goal. And the more likely you're going to have to go to insulin therapy. And insulin therapy for type 2 diabetic patients is really quite difficult. And insulin is not a cheap drug, by the way. I think most of you are familiar with what's going on with insulin prices in the last five uh, to ten uh, years, okay? So let's now take a look at the diabetic patient, people with established diabetes. And what I'm going to show you is that when you look at pre-diabetics, they have exactly the same disease as diabetes, diabetic patients. Their A1C, A1C hasn't gotten to that magical number of 6.5 but they basically have the same defects in insulin secretion and in tissue sensitivity to insulin. So when I gave the Lilly Lecture in 1987, I entitled it the Triumvirate, okay? And at that point, uh, I uh, emphasized three major defects in people with type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance in the liver. This led to overproduction of glucose through the sleeping hours and fasting hyperglycemia. Insulin resistance in the muscle, when you eat a meal, the glucose is taken up and disposed of in the muscle. This is insulin resistance leading to postprandial hyperglycemia. And then beta cell failure, which is exacerbating both the underlying defects. But over the last 15 years, uh, there have been two major advances in our understanding of the disease. So the first is that the beta cell failure occurs much earlier in the natural history of the disease much, much more severe than we had previously uh, appreciated. So uh, over the years, we've carried out two big studies. One is the uh, Vegas study, Veterans Administration Genetic Epidemiologic Study. The other is the San Antonio Metabolism Study, uh, in which we have used the gold standard for beta cell function, which obviously, as I take you through this, people can't do this in their office. So the gold standard for beta cell function is to give people a glucose lower to the meal, and the glucose is going to rise, and in response to the increment in glucose, there's going to be an increment in insulin. So this is a rough index of beta cell function. But the beta cell can also read the severity of the insulin resistance. So on a separate day, we can do an insulin clamp study, which is the gold standard for measuring insulin sensitivity, and we get a quantitative measure of insulin resistance. So now on the y-axis, what I plotted for you is this gold standard of beta cell function. Increment in insulin per increment in glucose, all factored by how insulin resistant you are, and I'm going to plot it against the 2-hour glucose as an index of your overall glucose tolerance. So let's take the people with normal glucose tolerance. So according to the ADA, I give you a 75-gram glucose load. Your glucose goes up. It's less than 140. You have normal glucose tolerance, okay? Well, the first point in the curve here is as good as your glucose tolerance can be. Glucose goes up two hours later, it's less than 100. Uh, second group, your glucose is between 100 and 120. Third group, between 120 and 139. 
And what you can see is in the upper tertile of normal glucose tolerance, you already lost 50% of your beta cell function. It doesn't make any difference whether you're lean or obese. Now let's put up the people with IGT. I divided them into three groups, 140 to 160, 160 to 180, 180 to 199. In the upper tertile of IGT, you lost 80 to 90% of your beta cell function. And with the insulin clamp, you're already maximally insulin resistant. You already have the two major defects that are present in people with type 2 diabetes, severe beta cell dysfunction and severe insulin resistance. And now I put up the people with diabetes. You don't have to lose but another 5 10% of your beta cell function, and your two-hour glucose looks pretty good, 180. Now it's 360. So the earlier that we intervene with drugs that are going to preserve beta cell function, the better off we are going to be in preventing the pre-diabetic state to going to the diabetic uh, state. Now, in everyday life, things don't happen in uh, 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 absolute terms. They ha happen at the log function. So what I've done is just taking the previous data, I've log transformed the two-hour glucose on the x-axis, I've log transformed the beta cell function index on the y-axis, and the NGT people are in yellow, IGT in green, and the type 2 diabetics in orange. This is a completely linear curve, okay? Uh, so the worse your beta cell function, the higher is your two-hour glucose. Now, if I were to take the color off of these slides, see, it's pretty obvious who are NGT, IGT, and type 2 diabetes here, but if I eradicated the color, and I, uh, if, if I ask you now, uh, go up there, where would you put the dividing point for IGT and type 2 diabetes? You wouldn't know where to point it. Put it. The point here is that there's not some clear-cut separation of, quote, diabetes from prediabetes from normal glucose tolerance. This is a continuum, and the earlier you intervene, the better off you're going to be in terms of preserving beta cell function. So people with IGT, a prediabetic state, they're already maximally or near maximally resistant to insulin. They've lost 80% of their beta cell function, they've lost a significant amount of their beta cell mass, and if you look at what's published, and I think this is less well appreciated, the incidence of diabetic retinopathy, and of course it's background, not proliferative retinopathy, or microalbumin or peripheral neuropathy is in the range of 10 to 20%. So the microvascular complications are already starting, although they're not at the level of severity that really present a major problem to our diabetic patients, but we don't want them to advance. And if your A1C is less than six and a half, you are simply not going to develop any of these microvascular complications. Now, what's the next major advance in our understanding of diabetes? So when I gave the Banting Lecture in 2008, I titled it From the Triumvirate to the Ominous Octet. So the core defects uh, at 11 uh, uh, p.m. on this slide impaired insulin secretion, insulin resistance at the liver at seven, uh, the muscle uh, insulin resistance at five are still there. But now we have five other defects, insulin resistance in the fat cell, fat cell pouring out fat into the bloodstream, elevated free fatty acids impair insulin secretion, make insulin resistance in the liver and muscle worse, exacerbate the core defects. At 12 o'clock, you can see the decreased incretin effect. When you eat a meal, you release two incretin hormones, GLP-1, glucon-like peptide 1, GIP, glucose-dependent insulinotrophic polypeptide. Collectively, those two incretin hormones are responsible for 70% of the insulin that you release during a meal. And what we know is that uh, there's not a deficiency of GLP-1 or GIP, but your beta cells and alpha cells are severely, severely resistant to GLP-1 and GIP. At 9 p.m., the uh, uh, islet oversecretes glucagon, shown many, many years ago by Dr. Roger Unger. Diabetics have hyperglucagonemia, and we showed that if you infuse glucagon, your liver is hypersensitive uh, to glucagon. <clears throat> we know that there's major dysfunction at the level of the brain. So what's driving the epidemic of diabetes in the last 50 years is the epidemic of obesity. So in the hypothalamic area, which is the appetite-regulating area, there are hormones that are secreted that turn off our appetite, GLP-1 being a very important one. Well, it turns out that your brain is severely resistant to GLP-1. 
There are another, a number of other appetite suppressant hormones uh, that your brain has become resistant to. And then at 3 o'clock, and uh, Zan mentioned this earlier, what we know is that the threshold for spilling glucose into the kidney is markedly elevated in diabetic patients. And that drug with which we did the initial studies, fluorescein, markedly lowers the threshold. And now we have a number of drugs in the SGLT2 inhibitor class that will lower the threshold very effectively and induce glucosuria. So if you think about this, <laughs> there are eight problems. There's no way that one drug is going to correct eight problems. So when we think about the treatment of type 2 diabetes, this is going to require multiple drugs, and the drugs that we use should be designed to correct the underlying pathophysiologic abnormalities. So if you understand the pathophysiology, and I've basically spent, well, I've been continuously funded by the National Institutes of Health since 1975, my work has focused on defining what are the pathophysiologic disturbances. But what's disappointing to me is that we understand what causes the disease, and then we turn around and use drugs that don't work to correct the underlying pathophysiology. And at the top of the list, I would put the cell phone ureas. They do bind to the, the beta cell. They do kick out insulin initially, overcomes the insulin resistance. But on a long-term basis, they don't preserve beta cell function. And we need to start early in the natural history of the disease. So I would say, for sure, at the time we make the diagnosis of diabetes, but I actually believe in very high-risk people, uh, particularly with a strong family history of diabetes, we should be thinking about starting in the pre-diabetic state. Now, to illustrate these points uh, and to, to uh, emphasize what drugs do and don't do, I'm going to go back to the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study done by Dr. Robert Turn. I had nothing to do with this study, uh, but it's a landmark study because it's the very first study that showed that uh, improved glycemic control decreased microvascular complications. So for the young people out there, they won't appreciate this. But when I was growing up, there was an argument as to whether glucose control made any difference at all. Many people believed that complications were genetically determined, and it didn't make any difference if you lowered the A1C and people with type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Turner initiated this study, and there were about 4,200 people in the study, and he took newly diagnosed patients with an A1C of 7, one-third gut conventional treatment, diet, and exercise. You can see here in yellow, the A1C just rose progressively. And why did it rise progressively? Because of progressive beta cell failure. If you do not have a drug on board that prevents the progressive beta cell failure, the A1C is going to rise continuously. So, and one additional group got treated with gybenclamide, a cell falling urea. It kicks out insulin. The hyperinsulinemia overcomes the insulin resistance. You can see very nicely in the first year, A1C went down, and then what happened after the first year? It just rose progressively. And he had a, a crude measure of uh, beta cell uh, function, HOMA beta. I don't like it, but it's the only one he had. And he showed that all of the rise with glybenclamide after the first year was due to progressive beta cell failure. What about metformin? It works on the liver. It is not really a true insulin sensitizer in muscle uh, or in liver. It knocks down gluconeogenesis. Uh, you lower hepatic glucose production, fasting glucose and A1C go down. It works very well in the first year. But look what happened after the first year. Progressive rise in A1C because there's no beta cell protection, okay? But the, this 1% separation between the conventional and treatment groups led to a 37% decrease in the microvascular complications. So this was a landmark study. But nonetheless, we should be able to do better. We should be able to prevent that rise in A1C. So Dr. Turner noted that about five years that the A1C had come back to its baseline level of seven. So he actually changed the design because he could see that his interventions were not working. If you're on metformin, he added glybenclamide. If you're on glybenclamide, he added metformin. And then he said, if necessary, I'm going to add insulin. Now, he's published multiple papers, five papers, diabetes, diabetes care, diabetes, JAMA, Lancet, okay? This curve is just taken from this. And basically, what happened after 15 years, okay? Look at where the A1C is. Virtually all of the people are on glybenclamide and metformin. They're on combination therapy. And 65% of the people are on insulin. And the A1C is about 8.5, 
okay? So we know what glybeclomide metformin are going to do. They don't preserve beta cell function. Now, personally, as Ann told you, I actually was the only person involved in bringing metformin to the United States from Leafa Pharmaceuticals in uh, 1995. I like metformin. And in 1995, this was a fantastic drug. It's still a fantastic drug. But we need other drugs that are going to work to preserve beta cell function. Now, <laughs> let's look at the TZDs. There are eight long-term studies with TZDs, meaning more than a year and a half. And this curve looks very different from what I just showed you in UK PDS. And what you can see, whether it's pioglitazone, rosiglitazone, whatever the initial drop in A1C is, it stays down. Uh, now, it, you can see there are studies with pioglitazone, rosiglitazone. Why was the initial drop in A1C different? Well, the study designs are different. Some people are on metformin, and then I just add the TCD. Some people are on metformin, I take the metformin away, and I substitute uh, uh, the TCD. But whatever one I intervene with, you see, the A1C is really uh, maintained. And in the ADOPT study by Dr. Kahn, it's maintained for upwards of five to six years, okay? Uh, now, if the A1C comes down and stays down, there's only one way this can happen is the TZDs must be having a major effect on the beta cell. In fact, that is their major mechanism uh, of uh, action. They are also great insulin sensitizers, but most people don't appreciate the potent effect on uh, the uh, beta cell. And as I said, pioglitazone is now generic. It's a really quite inexpensive drug, but there are perceptions about bladder cancer, which I believe the uh, studies uh, that were mandated by the FDA have now indicated that uh, PO glitazone does not increase the risk for bladder cancer. So what do we know about TZD? It gives you a durable reduction in A1C. It's a potent insulin sensitizer. It's really very good at preserving beta cell function. We have the uh, proactive study and the IRIS study, two cardiovascular outcome trials, which I'll show you in a second, which were uh, very positive. It reverses lipotoxicity. So as fat builds up in your liver, makes your liver resistant, this is NASH. Fat builds up in your muscle, insulin resistance in your muscle. Fat builds up in your beta cell, beta cell failure. TZDs mobilize the fat out of these tissues, uh, and that contributes to the improvement in insulin sensitivity beta cell function. We have five studies with TZDs, pioglitazone, showing reversal of NASH in NAFL, okay? It's very good at lowering blood pressure. It's a vasodilator. It improves endothelial dysfunction. It reduces inflammation. C-reactive protein goes down. It corrects diabetic dyslipidemia, and you don't get hypoglycemia with this drug. So let me just review for you the proactive study. This was carried out in Europe, 5,238 patients, high risk. They had had a previous MI stroke or something bad. Half the people placed on pioglitazone, half the people placed on placebo. And to the left, you can see the hazard ratio is 0.84, a 16% decrease in the MACE endpoint, which is Kaplan-Meier plot to death, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. This is the MACE endpoint, which the FDA uses <clears throat> as the primary criteria for showing that a drug works. So why did this drug not get approved? Because in this study, this was the second <clears throat> principal endpoint, the first uh, endpoint was MACE plus leg revascularization, and we now know that leg revascularization really responds poorly to all interventions. That's what respond well to statins, blood pressure lowering, or glucose uh, lowering. Now, this slide is taken actually from the FDA website. So when Takeda carried out their studies, to get into these studies, so this was to get the drug approved by the FDA, you could add pioglitazone to drug-naive patients, to people on metformin, SUs, et cetera, and you could not have had a previous cardiovascular event to get into the study. So the hazard ratio, and this is a, a meta-analysis done by the FDA, no pharmaceutical company, no uh, individual investigator, 0.75. Now, more recently, we've had the IRIS trial. So if you go back to uh, the uh, proactive study, if you had a stroke and I place you on pioglitazone, there was a 47% decrease in recurrent stroke. Now, Dr. Silvio Insucci at Yale was very well of these data, 
And he and people in the neurology field, Dr. Kernan, went to the National Institutes of Health and convinced the NIH that they should do a long-term prospective people uh, who either had a stroke or TIA within three months and treated them with pioglitazone. But what was unique about the IRIS study is these people could not have diabetes, okay? Yeah. So this is a non-diabetic population with a, either a stroke or a TIA within three months. And you can see this is a very large study, 3,800 people carried out for five years, that the hazard ratio for recurrent stroke is 0.76, a 24% reduction. This is incredibly impressive. And obviously, this is not because I lowered your glucose, because you are not diabetic. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors. These drugs correct a novel defect that marks the threshold of glucose reabsorption in the kidney that does not allow the kidney to dump glucose when the blood sugar level goes up. It gives you a nice durable reduction in A1C. As the A1C drops, uh, a concept that we developed in people many years ago, the concept of glucotoxicity. High glucose makes your muscle insulin resistance impairs beta cell function. As you put the glucose out in the urine and your blood glucose comes down, I improve insulin sensitivity in muscle, I improve beta cell function, okay? These drugs also now in prospective trials have been shown to be cardioprotective, and at least two drugs in this category have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for prevention uh, of uh, recurrent cardiovascular events in a high-risk population. They give us real protection. And just recently, we've been told that the Cretan study, which was designed to look at prevention to going to end-stage renal disease, was positive. This was stopped six months earlier. In April, we'll see the actual data uh, at a meeting that's carried out at, that, at a nephrology meeting in Australia. These drugs are very good at lo lowering blood pressure. They promote weight loss because you lose glucose calories in the urine, no hypoglycemia. A very, very, I would say, uh, positive uh, profile. So this now uh, is a summary of the infrared outcome data. So this is the first two, first SDLT2 inhibitor approved by uh, the uh, FDA, showing that uh, empagliflozin, the first uh, uh, panel, uh, significantly reduced the MACE endpoint, hazard ratio 0.86. In the middle, what really drove the MACE endpoint was decreasing cardiovascular death and then to the far right, marked decrease in hospitalization for heart failure. Now, we also know that uh, the CANVAS data with canaglyphosin are very similar to the EMPA-REG data, and uh, CANA, like EMPA, have been approved in people with uh, high risk who have had a cardiovascular event for prevention of the cardiovascular event. And most recently, we have the DECLARED data uh, this is a, had a somewhat complicated endpoint. The MACE endpoint did not reach statistical significance. The other primary endpoint, which was uh, hospitalization for heart failure and mortality, was statistically significant. And just this week, there is a sub-analysis uh, of the data uh, looking at uh, people uh, who had a, a, a Marcarl infarction who were then treated with... Uh, 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 dapagliflozin, and there was a significant decrease in recurrent uh, Mark Carl infarction. These data uh, have not been uh, sort of reviewed uh, by the FDA yet, so we don't know what uh, kind of indication the FDA is going to give, but I would say all three of these drugs uh, are doing something very positive in the cardiovascular system and therefore should be uh, escalated uh, to first-line therapy in our diabetic patients. Now, what about GLP-1 receptor agonists? They very effectively reduce the A1C. These drugs are very, very good at preserving beta cell function. They promote weight loss. They correct six of the known pathophysiologic defects in the ominous octet. They don't cause hypoglycemia. They have an excellent profile, and they also uh, give us cardiovascular protection. So, what do we know about the cardiovascular outcome trials? So the, Lira, uh, uh, the leader study with liraglutide, big study, 9,000 people. Uh, you can see here hazard ratios 0.87, 13% reduction in the MACE endpoint, 
in uh, FDA has now given uh, approval uh, for uh, this high-risk uh, population. Uh, if we look at semaglutide, a smaller study, which was carried out looking for safety, non-inferiority, but impressively, the hazard ratio is 0.74, highly statistically significant. And the company now is doing a much larger study uh, uh, in, in high-risk uh, patients. To the, res to the right is the Excel study. Uh, this did not quite reach statistical significance. P-value is 0.06. I would say, really, is there a difference between 06 and 05? More importantly, this study was started with the old preparation of Bidurion. So there was a very, very high discontinuation rate, and there was also a high drop-in of SGLT2 inhibitor use in the placebo group. There has been a reanalysis taking out all SGLT2 inhibitor-treated patients and shows a significant reduction in cardiovascular events. And most recently in the Rewind uh, uh, study, Trulicity uh, has been shown to be uh, uh, cardioprotective, although uh, we haven't seen the data. So we really have four studies uh, either showing positive or suggesting positive uh, uh, preve uh, results, prevention of cardiovascular events in high-risk populations with the GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, metformin is very commonly stated to be anti-atherogenic, and I want to review with you where these data come from. They come from the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study. Well, how many people were in the uh, metformin arm? So these are drug-naive patients. They're overweight. I add metformin. 342 people. Uh, not 342 events. 342 people. This would never even be reviewed by the Food and Drug uh, Administration. Okay? But what I want to bring your attention to is the bottom line here. There was another arm in UKPDS. These were people who were on sulfonylureas to whom I added metformin. Well, <laughs> diabetes-related death was increased by 39%. It's interesting that no one picks on this arm. So my take of UKPDS is that really we don't know what metformin does in terms of anti-atherogenic uh, potential. There is a study that's going on in the VA to look at this, but it's going to be a while. Now, uh, Metformin is not going to change from being first-place therapy uh, because it's got a long track record of safety. It is effective at least for two or three uh, years. Uh, but in terms of cardiovascular protection, I think it really remains unclear whether it is anti-atherogenic or not. Now, uh, we also know uh, from the Empharag outcome study and also from the CANVAS study, that it's very likely that the SGLT2 inhibitors will provide renal protection. So this is uh, a summary of the Empareg outcome data. I could show you identical data from the CANVAS study and very similar data with dapagliflozin. But there was a 39% decrease in the composite endpoint, uh, the renal composite endpoint. So what were the three components of this endpoint? Doubling of the serum creatinine in people with a GFR less than 40. So if you have a GFR less than 40, that means your creatinine is about 1.8 to 2. You double your creatinine, it goes from 2 to 4. You're talking to the nephrologist about going on dialysis. You can see in blue a 38% decrease in macroalbuminuria, and then renal replacement therapy, meaning prevention of going to dialysis or transplantation, 55%. Each individual component was statistically significant, not surprisingly, the composite was statistically significant. I could show you very similar data with canagliflozin or DAPA. Now, the Credence study was designed to get approval from the Food and Drug Administration for prevention of going to end-stage renal disease. Uh, and uh, the Credence study, as I uh, told you earlier, was stopped six months earlier. Now, in Credence, the endpoint was progression to end-stage renal disease or protection against cardiovascular events. The study was stopped six months earlier. Uh, we don't know the sort of granularity of the data, but I'm assuming that they wouldn't stop the study unless the renal endpoint was statistically significant, uh, but we'll have to see what's driving the endpoint. Was it cardiovascular, a decrease in cardiovascular events, decrease in renal events, or the combination uh, thereof? 
So here is the Credence study. You could get into Credence because you had a GFR 30 to 90. Well, if you have a GFR of 90, why would you get into this study? Because you can see the next line, this is the urinary, urinary albumin to creatinine ratio because you had macroproteinuria. So you can have either of the two or both to get into the study. It's a long-term study over 5.5 uh, years. You can see the primary endpoint, composite of end-stage renal disease, doubling of the serum creatinine of cardiovascular death. So we're all very excited to see the actual data that will be presented in April uh, at a nephrology meeting in uh, Australia. Now, this is something that I think is critically important that is uh, uh, oftentimes neglected and really is not appropriately addressed in the ADA uh, algorithm, and that is pathophysiology of the disease and preservation of beta cell function. So there are a number of ways that you can look at beta cell uh, uh, function. Uh, I'm going to show you a very simple one. The, the more complicated one that I showed you earlier, the increment in insulin per increment in glucose uh, during the OGDT, all affected by how insulin resistant you are, can't be carried out uh, but in a few sort of uh, clinical research labs. But there's a very simple technique that was developed uh, by Ken Polanski, uh, and it's called, I call it the graded glucose infusion of Polanski. We're just going to plug in an IV, and we're going to raise your glucose from 80 up to here, up to 240 or so. And as I infuse glucose and I raise your glucose concentration, you can see that the insulin secretory rate in normal glucose tolerant individuals goes up literally at about a 40 degree, 45 degree angle. When I do this study in diabetics, you can see this curve is very flat. The diabetic beta cell is blind to glucose. This is the characteristic lesion. Now, I'm going to, or I, Dr. Chang is going to treat these people with a single dose of liraglutide, 7.5 microgram per kilogram. If you are 100 kilograms, I'm basically giving you 0.75 milligrams of liraglutide. Uh, they're a very, very small dose. And then I'm going to come back eight hours later, and I'm going to repeat this study. And lo and behold, I've just given you normal beta cell function, okay? This study has been carried out with semaglutide for 12 weeks in exactly the same results. And then using the more sophisticated measure of beta cell function, we have a study with exenatide showing that after three years, you have normal beta cell function. So this is fantastic. The downside is if I stop the drug, then your beta cell function deteriorates. But you need to remember, I can get rid of the genes that are causing the beta cell dysfunction. I'm correcting the abnormality, so if I stop the drug, the abnormality is going to come back. This is no different from hypercholesterolemia or hypertension. I lower your cholesterol with a statin or your blood pressure with an antihypertensive drug. If I stop the statin or the antihypertension drug, your cholesterol and blood pressure are going to go back up. So... This is the last slide. We have now uh, a number of studies which show not only effective glucose lowering, but cardiovascular protection. So GLP-1 receptor agonists, we have leader, sustain 6, Excel, Rewind. Pioglitazone, we have proactive, iris, the FDA analysis of all the studies that were presented to them. We have a real-world study uh, carried out in Scandinavia in England. We have two anatomical studies, Periscope in Chicago. Periscope showing regression of plaque in uh, the uh, coronary arteries. Chicago showing a slowing of progression of carotid intermedial thickness. With the SGLT2 inhibitors, we have three studies, uh, Empha-reg outcome, canvas declare. Metformin, as I said, uh, I think we really don't know what metformin does in terms of anti-atherogenesis. Now, the good part of these cardiovascular outcome studies, uh, and to me it's a little disappointing that we, meaning the diabetes community, didn't do this. The cardiologists now did these cardiovascular intervention trials, and now the ADA has finally changed the algorithm approach to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. They still have metformin in first place, but they then say if you have now an individual who has predominant atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the second drug on board should be uh, a, a GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 inhibitor. If you have someone on metformin and you have predominant heart failure, SGLT2 inhibitor should be the next drug or a 
GLP-1 receptor agonist after SGLT2. If you are a metformin and you have predominant renal disease, then they recommend uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor. Now, I think that there's a, uh, another step that should have been taken here and that these drugs should have been moved to first line ahead of metformin. So let me give you uh, why I, an example of why I believe that. I don't have diabetes. Uh, let's say today I develop chest pain. I go to the hospital, and it's very clear I'm having a STEM EMI. They measure my A1C, and my A1C is 8.3. I'm a newly diagnosed diabetic. According to the ADA algorithm, I should go on metformin. But as a patient, I want to go on the drug that's going to prevent me from having a recurrent myocardial infarction. Metformin, in my opinion, has not been demonstrated to do that. I would opt for a GLP-1 receptor agonist or pioglitazone or an SGLT2 inhibitor or some combination thereof. Nonetheless, I think the new ADA algorithm is a major step forward. The ACE algorithm already indicates that first-line therapy can be metformin or GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. So I lean toward the, uh, the ACE uh, algorithm. In addition, the ACE algorithm favors initial therapy if your A1C is above 7.5 with combination therapy, I favor combination therapy right from the time of diagnosis, independent of what your A1C is. So I think that I've given you enough talking points for a discussion, so I'm going to stop at this point, and I think it will be opened up uh, to questions, and I'll try to address them as they come in. And I want to thank everybody for listening in. I hope you found this to be informative. Wow, what a tour de force. Uh, thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, uh, we had some people who had to leave, but they were expressing similar sentiments. Mm -hmm. Going back to, at this point, just reminding folks who might have questions about the chat column on the right of your screen where you can type in questions. Um, the first question was by Joe McManaman, but he had to leave, so we'll follow up with him later. Steve Freed asked, why not just make the diagnosis of diabetes to a lower FBG or A1C, essentially change the diagnosis of diabetes to prediabetes and remove prediabetes from the dictionary? Yeah. So this is a very common question. It's been debated and discussed at the American Diabetes Association, and there are some people who actually favor that, and there are some people who don't. So what are the arguments? If you favor it, from the standpoint of pathophysiology, I think you're on very sound ground. So if your A1C is 6.2, you got all of the, the pathophysiologic defects, so why not treat? But should we lower it to 6.2? Should we lower it to 6? So that becomes a point for discussion. And then on the other side is the economical issue. If we lower the A1C, say, to 6 as the diagnosis for uh, diabetes, that means a lot more people are going to be treated. That's an economic burden that some people say that the economic system in the U.S. cannot absorb that. Uh, so there's a lot of controversy here, and I think that people need to look at each individual person. You live here in San Antonio, and I have a patient, 40 years old. They're overweight. Uh, they come. They have an A1C of 6.2. The mother and father have type 2 diabetes. For sure, I'm going to treat that person. <clears throat> Hispanic origin, bad genes. I have a Caucasian person, age same age, 40. A1C is say, 5.8, no family history of diabetes, no components of the uh, insulin resistant syndrome, I'm going to watch that patient. So I think there needs to be some judgment. And the higher the risk of the person, the more likely I am going to treat. But obviously, there is a considerable controversy about uh, whether we are, or not we should lower the uh, diagnostic goal. Super. Steve had a follow-on question, a distinct question. What percentage of the U.S. population uh, have prediabetes, 90 million is the figure on the slide, that don't know that they have prediabetes? And I have a related question, which is, should all whatever obese means, obese people assume they have prediabetes, and on the complementary side, what non-obese people have prediabetes? Yeah, so the majority of, of course, people who have prediabetes are overweight, and that is why the task force, when they said who should be screened, said adults over the age of 45, those who are uh, overweight or uh, obese. But remember, if you have a completely healthy beta cell 
even though you're obese and insulin resistant, uh, your beta cell for, the, for your entire life will secrete enough insulin to overcome the insulin resistance that goes with obesity, and you, may, you will not develop uh, diabetes. Uh, uh, but when you're insulin resistant, you're very likely to have the metabolic syndrome. And the metabolic syndrome is a whole host of cardiovascular risk factors. So even if you don't develop diabetes, you're at risk for cardiovascular disease. So those people need to be followed very carefully, even if they don't develop diabetes, to make sure all the cardiovascular risk factors are taken care of. And I would say the majority of people who have, quote, prediabetes really don't know that they have it. The one group that does have it where we could really do something are the people with gestational diabetes. So a lady develops diabetes during pregnancy, uh, and then uh, after she delivers her baby, make this simple one-third go back to normal glucose tolerance, one-third stay as diabetes, one-third one stay as prediabetes. These people are oftentimes who have prediabetes lost the follow-up. So that's a very high-risk population who we should be following very carefully, and they do know that they're at risk. But the average person who's overweight out in the community who might have prediabetes is probably unaware that he or she has it. Thank you. Uh, Charlie Alexander and Larry Hirsch had a couple of questions and comments. This was in reference to the TZDs. Uh, Charlie said, what about the weight gain and the HF from TZDs? Larry said, and long bone fractures. Although Larry said, obviously, no drug is perfect, so you got to balance the pros and cons. Uh, I guess his view is that for PO, he thinks the pros outweigh the cons. you got to choose patients carefully. So I, I would agree uh, with him. Now, I, I'm going to address the weight gain and then the fluid retention and these side effects. I'll do it quickly because there are a lot of things to put this into perspective. The, the more weight you gain, the greater the drop in A1C. The more weight you gain, the greater the improvement in insulin sensitivity. <clears throat> the more weight you gain, the greater the improvement in beta cell function. The more weight you gain, the greater the drop in triglycerides. The more weight you gain, the greater the rise in HDL uh, cholesterol. The more weight you gain, uh, the uh, greater the improvement in endothelial dysfunction. So weight gain is a cosmetic issue. It is not a metabolic issue. So I take you back to proactive. And what's interesting is that cardiologists don't even know this, what I'm going to tell you. So if you go back to proactive, that study, 5,238 patients who had a previous MI, and then we're randomized to placebo or pioglitazone. There was only one factor that predicted that you would not die. What was the factor? Weight gain. So when I give talks, I joke about it, but it's true. Would you rather be obese and alive or lean and dead? You can take your choice, okay? So obviously, weight gain with TZDs doesn't have the same implications as weight gain when you overeat. Now, in terms of bone fractures, it's mostly premenopausal women. So you can just argue, I won't treat premenopausal women uh, uh, with it. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's mostly uh, postmenopausal women. You can just argue, I won't treat them, okay? Every postmenopausal woman should have a bone mineral density uh, scan. And if they have a decreased bone mineral density, I wouldn't treat them uh, with a, a TZD. If they have normal bone mineral density, I would treat them. Fluid retention. The drug should not be given in people class 3, 4 heart failure. That's pretty clear. But the, if the, the, the drug really doesn't do anything negative to the heart. In fact, we've done studies, and there are other data, that pioglitazone actually is very good at improving diastolic dysfunction, which is the major problem in type 2 diabetics. But it also makes you retain fluid because it has an effect on the kidney. And so now you have to balance. If you, if you really have advanced heart failure, you're not aware of it, and I put you on the drug, you retain fluid, I can tip you over into heart failure. But if you're treating newly diagnosed patients or people with uh, normal uh, cardiac function or near normal, this is not going to be a problem. And in my opinion, you shouldn't go above 30 milligrams. You get 80% uh, of the efficacy and 20% only of the, the side effects at 80 milligrams. Uh, so if you're starting with 15 milligrams, not going above 30, I think the drug uh, can be used quite safely. Uh, and the, the, uh, as Larry said, that the benefits, particularly the cardiovascular benefits, far outweigh uh, the, uh, any negative aspects of the drug. Super. Ravi Kumar, thank you for a great lecture. 
and asks, what's your opinion on adding anti-inflammatories such as NSAIDs and RAS blockers to metformin for maintaining or restoring beta cell function? Yeah, well, I'd say there are really no good studies that uh, adding anti-inflammatory agents, or at least as we know them today, are going to preserve beta cell function. And uh, as you probably are aware, there's a recent cardiovascular study with an anti-inflammatory agent that showed that there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular events. The study did not yet gain approval by the Food and Drug Administration, but I would say in terms of anti-inflammatory effects, there's a lot of potential for protection against cardiovascular disease, and my guess is that one of the major mechanisms by which pioglitazone reduces cardiovascular events is by its anti-inflammatory effects. And we see that in the IRIS study where there's a very nice drop in the C-reactive protein. And remember in IRIS, we, we, we saw this reduction in recurrent stroke in uh, uh, cardiovascular events in a non-diabetic population. So clearly this is not improved glycemic control, which is driving cardiovascular benefits in the IRIS. Terrific. Todd Lawrence asks, in pre-diabetes, how would you approach IGT versus IFT? <laughs> well, we have a study that's now funded by the National Institutes of Health uh, to look at this. Uh, so as I told you, I think that the pathophysiology of the diseases are different. So what we're doing, and this is really a mechanistic uh, study as well as uh, an efficacy study. We're taking people with IGT and they're being treated with four drugs. The sort of gold standard is metformin, and we're also in other groups be treated with DPP-4 inhibitor, another group with an SGLT-2 inhibitor, another group with pioglitazone. And now we're taking a separate group of people with IFG, and they're being treated with the same four uh, medications. So this study is ongoing. Uh, uh, we don't have the results, uh, of course. Uh, uh, my prediction is that people who have insulin resistance in muscle, that's IGT, they are very likely to respond better to pioglitazone. People who have insulin resistance in the liver, okay, in an elevated fasting glucose, are very likely to respond better to an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor. Uh, but this is now speculation at this point uh, because this study, as I said, is ongoing, uh, and we'll probably know in another year to a year and a half what the, the, the results are. So at the current time, we all have our favorite drug. Uh, some people like metformin. Some people like SGLT2 inhibitors. Some people like pioglitazone. Uh, what we would do is empirically, if you believe people should be treated high risk, you would put them on the drug, and then you would monitor the A1C. So let's say I had someone with an A1C of 6.4, and I started pioglitazone at 15 milligrams, and uh, it dropped to, say, 6.1 or 6. Uh, I would say that's, that's good. I might increase the, the dose to uh, 30 milligrams. I might just watch the patient at 6.1. But I would be following the A1C, whatever the intervention is. And if the A1C doesn't go down, then probably I would change to another uh, intervention. And as I said, you know, treatment of prediabetes uh, is a somewhat controversial topic. Uh, 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 but from my standpoint, if you're at very high risk, I favor intervention, uh, although um, I will admit there's no long-term study that's gone on for 10 or 15 years to show that I've reduced cardiovascular events or prevented eye, kidney, or nerve damage. Terrific. Michael Nerwinski asks, there has been some discussion that A1C is not an ideal test for diagnosing or treating diabetes. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Well, it's a very good test, uh, but there are other things that are also important. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, the idea, if you ask me, the ideal test was, would be to know what, what's happening to their insulin sensitivity and their beta cell function. This is not practical in real life. A1C is pretty practical. Uh, fasting glucose, as I said, it gives you uh, an indication of resistance in liver, first phase insulin secretion. Uh, the two-hour glucose during the OGT is clearly the most sensitive. Well, it's a stress test. 
but it takes time. Uh, it's more inconvenient. So I, I would say all of these tests, fasting glucose, two hour glucose, and A1C are all informative. Uh, and we have to deal with sort of practicality. And from the practicality standpoint, it's much easier for the doctor just to get a fasting glucose in the A1C. In terms of sensitivity, if you really want to pick up the people who are diabetic, I would say the OHDT in measuring the two-hour glucose is a more sensitive test. So uh, there are different ways in which you can uh, look at this. Uh, uh, I personally prefer the OGDT. And Jerome Shentag asks, does weight loss, uh, if you could do it, fix the entire octet, ominous octet? <laughs> the, and the fact is that weight loss makes all of those things better. And to the extent that you can lose more weight, every one of those things gets better to a greater degree. I mean, th there is no doubt that weight loss is the best treatment. And I think that we need to have better drugs that are on formularies to help our patients lose weight. Uh, and I think too often doctors blame the patient saying, the problem is you, you overeat, and you're uh, o obese. Uh, and that is true, but there's a lot of pathophysiology that's making the patient overeat. You know, there's resistance to GLP-1. There is, you don't respond normally to uh, leptin. There's resistance to leptin. I could go on and on and on. So we need to develop medications that will help the patient uh, lose weight. In addition, of course, to better eating habits, in addition to uh, better, uh, uh, in, uh, you know, exercise uh, program. We have taken 50 years to get into this obesity problem. It's going to probably take us 50 years to get out of it. Uh, and, and, and I think that we don't really appreciate obesity as a disease. Uh, and I think until we do that and we have better medications, uh, it's going to be a difficult uh, uh, disease to overcome. So Virginia Valentine made a comment. I'm not sure there's a question in here, but Jessica Simpson had an 11-pound baby. She clearly had gestational diabetes. Well, the more weight gain, the less you have to wear. So unless you want to comment on it, uh, Ralph, we'll move on. I love Virginia. Uh, right? So the next question from Larry Hirsch was, other than the cost, which is a very real issue for many patients, is there any downside to combining SGLP2 and uh, GLP1, uh, and I think you were referring to combinations in your slide deck, but uh, how would you comment uh, on that, Ralph? Yeah, so we've done these studies. Uh, so when you put SGLT2 with a GLP1, you, you do get an additive effect in dropping uh, A1C, but where the real boon comes in is some weight loss. Uh, so it, 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 we, we, this is sort of a non-denominational study, Canaglyflozin, which is made by one company, and Victoza is made by another company. Uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor, you lost about three kilograms. The GLP-1 receptor agonist, you lost about three uh, kilograms. You put the two together, you lost nine kilograms. Nine kilograms in a 100-kilogram person, you're getting close to 10% decrease in body weight. So that's very, very impressive. Uh, now, in terms of what would you expect in terms of cardiovascular outcomes? Uh, of course, there are no data uh, on this, but because SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists most likely work by different mechanisms, you might expect an added uh, or even synergistic cardiovascular benefit. Whether such studies will ever be done because the drugs are made by different companies uh, remains to uh, be seen. So we are big believers in combination therapy. And in fact, we start all of our patients on triple therapy right from the, the beginning. Uh, and as I said, we have four good drugs, in my opinion, that I use. GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, pioglitazone, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, and metformin. And we use these four drugs in combinations of two or three in all of our patients. So Ed Gillen asks, how would you view the role of short-term diagnostic CGM, so to speak, for those with prediabetes 
or with diagnosed type 2 diabetes to assist with uh, drug selection and or titration? Well, uh, of course, it would be great <laughs> if we could do it and it was practical uh, because it would give us a lot more insight in terms of the pathophysiology of uh, the disease. Uh, but I would say from the practicality standpoint, who should be getting uh, continuous glucose monitoring? For sure, every type 1 diabetic patient uh, should be on it. And I would even argue that every type 2 patient who's on insulin therapy should be on it because what we found is that if you look at type 2s who are on insulin therapy, that uh, 20 to 25% of the time, even though the A1C is in the normal range, they're out of the beyond the accepted hyperglycemic range, and 15 to 20% of the time, they're in a low hypoglycemic range. So continuous glucose monitoring uh, is helpful uh, in type 2s as well. Now, in terms of diagnosis or what we learn about prediabetes, I think it would be more of an investigative tool that could be used in the kind of studies that we're doing, but from the practical standpoint, uh, I don't see that catching on. Todd Lorenz asks, what's the name of the IFG IGT study that you're currently conducting? Uh, it doesn't have a, a name. Uh, it's a study that's uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, you can find it on clinicaltrials.gov, but it doesn't have a name. But I assure you that when it gets published, it will have a name that will hopefully be a catchy name. Okay. Fran Nilak asks, you noted in your talk that the ideal drug would cause weight loss to the person's optimal weight and improve other parameters. This can be achieved with a low-carbohydrate diet, as shown by Eric Westman at Duke, Integrative Medicine. What are your thoughts on adding a low-carbohydrate diet as an additional drug to the patient's treatment? And I suppose you could uh, add to that other classes of interventions that uh, have not yet been shown not to work over the long term. You have cognitive behavioral therapies, uh, noob is advertising, et cetera. What are your views about uh, such additions as being more effective than, uh, than historically? Yeah. So I would say, uh, first, uh, the, the most important, you know, there's a lot of fads and misconceptions about diet. The most important thing about diet is decreasing the calories. If you take in fewer calories, no matter whether it's fewer calories of carbohydrate, fat, or protein, you're going to lose weight. If you lose weight, everything gets better. Uh, and I don't believe that there's any diet that is sort of, uh, you know, the end all. The diet that works for an individual patient is the diet that the patient should be on. And as I tried to say right from the very beginning, the best treatment in the world is weight loss. So whatever diet that a patient can adhere to, and for which that patient can lose weight, uh, it would be fantastic. Uh, and every patient uh, who is diagnosed as diabetic should go through the ADA course uh, of diabetes education in which about half of the education value is uh, dietary uh, therapy. Uh, so I would agree that diet intervention is essential. Uh, the type of diet, I would say, is much, much more controversial. But whatever diet you're on, if there are fewer calories, you will lose weight, and that will work for your patients. Okay, Jerome Shentag asks, is getting a fasting insulin with the glucose and calculating an uh, OMA uh, IR a potential means of sorting out IFG and IGT? And the answer to that is uh, no. Uh, so. Uh, <clears throat> If you want to know whether a person is insulin resistant, okay, uh, then you can just simply measure the fasting insulin, okay? And if you are insulin resistant, the insulin level will be up. Uh, but whether you have IFG or IGT, okay, the fasting insulin level will be up. So for people with impaired fasting glucose, they have a high glucose. The beta cell responds to that, the fasting insulin is up. People who have IGT, they're insulin resistant in the muscle, the beta cell is responding to that, and the insulin level is up. So looking at the relationship uh, between insulin alone or insulin to glucose is really not going to be very helpful. If you simply want to know, is this person insulin resistant, you can measure the fasting insulin. 
But then I would ask you, look, let's say you found a person uh, who had a markedly elevated fasting insulin. Would you do anything about it? This is uh, sort of, we, we can't get the Food and Drug Administration to think about studies in prediabetes. Can you imagine taking someone with normal glucose tolerance and do documenting that the fasting insulin is increased threefold and then doing a study to treat that person, what would you treat them with uh, to show that you would prevent something? What would you be preventing? The macrovascular complications, because insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia a major risk factor. So I'd like to get some studies with prediabetes looking forward uh, to start at sort of the normal glucose tolerance stage to diagnose insulin resistance and ask for an intervention uh, that's approved by the FDA, I think is a long way off. On the other hand, I think insulin resistance is a major, major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. That's been shown in every single prospective study that's looked at it. Now, that's a different story from now saying, I'm going to do a study with an intervention. Good morning, Tony. 10 o'clock, I'm, uh, I'm about to see you. Oh, there's some competition on that answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, asks, assuming there are two patients, one diabetic and one pre-diabetic, if similar characteristics on BMI, age, and all such things, if they are, after lifestyle modification and exercise, they lose 18 k uh, kilograms, luckily they're both in a remission into normal glucose levels, then what's the different risk between those two patients, uh, for example, for uh, macro and micro uh, and diabetes recurrence? Well, uh Obviously, the person who already was diabetic is, in all likelihood, uh, now I might say this study has never been done, so I'm going to speculate here. The person who has diabetes has already lost more beta cells uh, because they're further in their disease than the, quote, pre-diabetic person. So even though they lose the same amount of weight and they go into, quote, remission, uh, they still have the genetic background that says there's going to be progressive beta cell failure. And because the person who already had diabetes is likely to have lost more beta cells, I would predict that that is the person that's more likely, maybe over the next five to ten years, uh, to see the diabetic state come back. So people need to recognize we don't cure diabetes. The only way you can cure diabetes is to go select your parents again and get a different set of genes. Okay? You cannot get rid of the genetic background. I can get rid of the lifestyle problem the obesity problem, lack of physical activity, okay? But you still have the genetic background. And we see this with, with, with bariatric surgery. What we're seeing is that even though, quote, they're in remission, uh, that uh, 10 to 15 years later, we see a significant percentage of the, these people, we see the diabetes coming back. So Anastasia Tolls asks, are there any spe thoughts specifically about ketogenic diets? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as I said, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy about ketogenic diets. And I think that the, the work that Sam Klein has done at Wash U, uh, to me, is the best work in this field, and it really shows the most important thing is calories. Now, to the extent that you... Uh, can go on a diet that will increase your ketone level, it's very well known that elevated ketones shut off your appetite. So it may well be for some people that that kind of diet that elevates the ketones uh, actually can help that person maintain the weight loss. But it still comes down to the fact that calories in equal calories out. And if you have too many calories coming in, you're going to gain weight. And what's ever the most effective way of decreasing caloric intake, if it's the ketogenic diet, that's fine. If it's eating one small one meal per day or if it's eating four or five small meals per day, uh, whatever works for that individual patient, in my opinion, is what should be work, what should be done for that patient. Well, Fran had a follow-up question. About, she was thinking about a low-carb diet that contains food with a glycemic index lower than 50 is that something that can also help uh, nudge uh, folks and, to take in less calories? Sure. I mean, <laughs> for some people it will work. For other people it won't work. Uh, right. But it still comes back to the fact that calories in equal 
calories out, and you've got to take in fewer calories. So if the low-carb, high diet works, uh, that's fine. Uh, if intermittent fasting works for you, that's fine. I just don't think there's any one magical cure in terms of diet. You know, we, we could probably spend, you know, hours debating this, and there are probably better people than I, uh, you know, people at the Pennington, uh, you know, as I said, Wash U, Sam Klein, uh, who could, you know, probably, uh, you know, may, maybe you ought to have one of these sort of obesity, uh, you know, programs and have Sam or someone from the Pennington discuss the pros and cons of these various diets. We could go on for probably days uh, on, on this alone. Right. So the last question I see here is from Steve Reed. How important is it to reverse first phase insulin response using GLT-1 or GLT-1, I guess, or and SGLT-2? Yeah. So if you're asking me, uh, uh, and, and I, I would turn it not just first phase insulin secretion, it's beta cell failure, okay? Now, it turns out that loss of first phase insulin secretion is the earliest defect. But basically what that's telling you is your beta cells are failing. The two classes of drugs that have direct effect on the beta cells that will improve beta cell function and maintain the improvement of beta cell function are the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the TZDs, which in the U.S. means pioglitazone. The SGLT2 inhibitors in the JCI paper that we published about two and a half years ago uh, with dapagliflozin, when we reduced the uh, plasma glucose uh, in diabetic patients uh, with dapagliflozin inducing glucosuria, we saw an, a, a 90, about a 90% improvement in beta cell function. That's all reversal of glucotoxicity. It's not a direct effect on the beta cell. Uh, so as I said, the two that really have potent beta cell effects directly are GLP-1, pioglitazone, indirectly SGLT2 inhibitors. And, you know, that triple combination therapy is a fantastic approach. Now, cost always becomes a big issue. Metformin is very inexpensive. And I told you it's one of my four good drugs. So that's a good one. Pioglitazone is now generic. It's basically no different in cost than metformin. Most of the companies for SGLT2 inhibitors actually have coupons that the patients really end up paying very little for the SGLT2 inhibitor. And for the GLP-1 receptor agonist, all of the insurance companies are supposed to have one of them on their formula with a reasonable copay. So for those, it is critical if you're going to use a GLP-1 receptor agonist that it be the one that's on the patient's you know, insurance. And even for those, for many of my patients, uh, a $25 a month copay can be expensive. For other people, a $25 a month copay is really quite acceptable considering how many really good things the GLP-1 receptor agonists do. So uh, we know what drugs work, okay? Uh, but uh, cost is always going to be uh, an issue. And in some countries outside of the United States, they're always going to be stuck with metformin and SUs. Uh, but personally, if I'm using drugs that treat my diabetic patients, and this is my personal experience and belief based on pathophysiology, I like GLP-1 receptor agonists. I like pioglitazone. I like SGLT2 inhibitors. I like metformin. So Simon Bruce has added a question. Is there any proof of concept for liver-specific insulin, including oral insulin, uh, as a viable strategy? It's an, a, no proof of concept, uh, but it's uh, definitely something that should be considered because if you had a liver-specific insulin uh, that uh, would go to the liver, what is it going to do? It's going to knock down hepatic glucose production. So throughout the sleeping hours, your liver is overproducing glucose. That's the cause of fasting hyperglycemia. So if I could give you, say, an oral insulin at night or even an injectable insulin that really didn't raise the plasma insulin concentration very much, so you don't have hypoglycemia, and specifically went to the liver and knocked down hepatic glucose production, I could get the diabetic to start their day with a normal fasting glucose. If they start their day with a fasting glucose at 160, you're always playing catch-up. You never get them control. So theoretically, this would be a potential good intervention. Uh, 
Do we have such a, a, an insulin? I am not convinced that we have one yet. Okay, and uh, Steve Fried and Michael Nowinski were asking uh, where can they listen to this program again. Jennifer Zhao is going to be producing a YouTube video of the slides and the audio track. It should be on our website within a couple business days. And uh, Jennifer, I believe, uh, will be sending out notices also to the registrants. Uh, at this point, I'd like to throw this back to uh, Zan Fleming, the executive chairman of, uh, of uh, Connectum, for any closing remarks. I can say as well, so no surprise, that's what Ralph always does, he wows the audience, and we could go on for the entire afternoon, but uh, all good things must come to an end. Ralph, many thanks, it was just terrific. I appreciate it, thank you, glad to do it for you. And thanks to the well, audience everybody. for attending and, uh, and participating in the discussion. So thanks, everyone. Uh, this is the close of our webcast. Uh, we wish you a good day and a great weekend. Thanks all for coming.